Hello everyone, thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you very much for coming in general. Uh, it's been amazing, like the energy in the room is so freaking awesome. So anyways, I'm gonna switch from organizing this to speaking. So hopefully I can do a good job. If not, Homer is gonna pick up my slack in here, which probably he will anyway, he always does. Uh, so yeah, so we are going to be talking today about achieving reusability through computationization. So, I don't know if some of you guys probably went to Drupal North 2017 in Ottawa. So, Homer and I did a talk about practical componentization. Basically, a few years ago, we were sold on this idea of uh, let's make this component thing and then we never have to redo again. And uh, we started, and it was really cool at the beginning, but then we quickly realized that it wasn't fully true. Basically, the reusability, it wasn't coming just by componentizing uh, our workflow and our system. So, let me ask you, how many people in here have uh, done or are doing Componentization for front end in Drupal. One in there, two, three, four. Okay, quite a bit. How many of you have heard about it? Okay, that's awesome. So, this talk in here is the next level from 2017. So, if you guys kind of get a little bit lost because we're going to be talking more about concept than diving into code. So, if you guys get a little bit lost, when you get home, kind of a watch the 2017 one at uh, our Drupal North uh, YouTube account, and then watch this one again, and then things will start making more sense. So, and this is the, the one we have. So, basically from this talking here, the idea is to share the vision that we had initially, and the, what we were trying to achieve. And uh, since last talk, we learned a lot and our idea is to share with you. There's a lot of answers that we don't have yet because it's just a learning process and everything. But one thing we have is the vision and the vision to achieve reusability. Uh, some of you maybe heard uh, Dries talking about that when, we, when they first started Drupal, it was all focused on the back end. And the front end, it's getting better, but it's still ugly because they were focusing on the back end. Which makes a lot of sense because now we have a solid product with a very ugly front end, but we developers know that. So now we can start improving this front end and that's what we achieve, try to achieve from this talk. Okay, so my name is Pierre Marcel. I am a front end, actually no, I am a technical architect and front end developer at Therefore. Uh, I live and breathe Drupal. I've been doing it for quite a few years. Started back in uh, 4.7. Uh, I am also one of the organizers for Drupal TO. Uh, so it's our monthly meetup in Toronto. So if you guys want to join or speak, please contact me. We meet uh, monthly. Okay. Uh, like I said, I love front end and Dele. I live and breathe that stuff. So. And I'm Sean Homer. I go by Homer because of the second Sean in the company. So I get confused when I introduce myself. It's kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> I've done lots of speaking over the past decade. Uh, some developer, some non. So uh, love front end. Uh, a lot of the tools and the initiatives around uh, Therefore we've been pushing for componentization and just improving front end experience for developers this has been a big push for me. And I'm writing a book for 12 years. It's going to be done one day. <laughs> awesome. So let's get started. So why this talk? It was because we were sold on the idea of a componentization equals reusability. So now we want to share with you what we discovered and uh, how we can solve a few problems and how we go from here. So that's the idea from this talk. Uh, we're going to be talking about framework and libraries. 
and standards because that's the whole idea of uh, supporting this system, establishing a set of architectural standards, making structural uh, architecture stand, no, sorry, making structural decisions uh, at component level, packing components across different projects, which is the main focus of this. So if we can't reuse, if we can't pack it, basically we are not achieving reusability. Uh, leveraging tools and streamlining workflow. So that's what we're going to be talking in here. Okay, so in order to, to do what we are trying to do, we have to follow standards. We have to have a vision in order to do this. Uh, because you can't, if you, if you don't have a vision, if you don't have standards, you can't pass that to other developers. And uh, they won't understand. Then we go back to chaos, building site, and the building site, and the building site, rather than reusing. So we have basically divided into three parts in here. So methodology. So who have heard here about uh, uh, atomic design? Okay, awesome. So it's a methodology for segregating and the grouping components on a way that it's easier to understand. It was created by this guy called uh, Brad Frost, and he's a designer. And uh, he went back to his high school days and uh, grabbed the chemistry analogy. So atoms, molecules, and organisms. So from little, very little to a big organism. So we decided to take this methodology. We had to make a few changes uh, in order to work with Drupal because we are mainly using this for Drupal, which technically we don't have to, but we are. Uh, so that's what we are doing. So we grab atomic design and change and adapt for our company. So you guys can use the same other one. As long as you have this standard and the vision is keep this standard. So Pattern Lab. Pattern Lab is the living style guide that we use. So why did we choose Pattern Lab? Pattern Lab uses Twig. Twig is using the Drupal. A lot of other living style guides, so for example, if you go Airbnb and some of the other stuff, what they do is they build their stuff, they grab their components, and they create a library, which technically you don't really use, it's just a visual library. We wanted to build a visual library that actually is the code that you're running on the front end as well. So Pattern Lab allows to do that. Uh, there is another one called KS that allows to do that as well. Uh, so, our living style guide. So we grab that as well and adapt to our workflow. And then Drupal. Drupal is Drupal. is what is powering the whole thing. And we divide it into three because here's the thing. We have a methodology. We have Panel Lab, which is our living style guide. And if we are starting a site, we can have our front-end developers building the front-end and we can have our back end building Drupal, totally separated. So that is what we are trying to achieve, which is, by the way, is working really, really good in that area. We can fully, today, there's a lot of times that uh, we have a, a full team building the front end, and they don't even talk to the back end, and then we just merge together, but of course, not really talking, but we have the vision and the standards, and that's why it start working. So here's a little list of stuff with uh, atomic design. Uh, so the basis of component coupling, draft the better suited working f with Drupal, to abstract with the proper standards and the back it up. So I'm not going to read through just pretty much what I just talking here before. So. And that's you. All right, so architectural standards. Um, I have a video which I'll loop through again, but kind of showcasing when you don't have standards and you start doing components. And you start building components for this and that, and you think, hey, you know, I'll make a component for everything. It doesn't work out too well in the end, especially when the idea of reusability comes back into play. You know, components get complex, 
or they're too generic and not useful to reuse. And you can have a lot of excess code that then makes it impossible or very confusing to maintain. And that is instant tech debt that probably is not going to be resolved in that project and have to be dealt with at some point. And then if you want to take it to a new project, you might be creating from scratch. So watching the video again, you see all these attributes that we're trying to serve. And for a carousal, instead of having an easy way to send different types, we have a different component for each type of carousal item. It gets very confusing and very convoluted for people to know how to use it. So, having architectural standards. The key things that we've been focusing on around this is having those established component types and knowing how they work together. You know, atomic design is a great concept, but it's very lightweight. And whether you use atomic design or not, you're going to start off with the basis of how your components work, but you have to get really nitty gritty with each of them to say, this is going to work this way, it's going to play with this kind, and this one is going to manage that. And you have to start building a clear vision of how these all work together so that as developers come on board and start working with new projects, they know how to access whole components that have been built and build new ones along the same manners. Uh, the other big thing is naming conventions. Um, we leverage between Pattern Lab and Atomic Design a BEM smack kind of uh, joining, I guess. And we adhere to names all over the place so that it's consistent. Again, helping anyone who reads it knows this is going to match this type of component, this type of component. Uh, file structure, also to make things as easy as possible for developers to go in and know these components match these Drupal templates and avoid some of the confusion or loop back to say, where is this, what is this doing? And lastly, as you're building these things, even going down to variables in the style to be aware of, you know, if I take this component out of this project, is it actually going to run in the next one? Right. Thinking about these things as you work. So, with the different component types, again, we are based on atomic design, so we have a clear set of atom, molecules, organisms. And then we've taken it a step further in using layouts to match things like Drupal nodes and content types, and then mockups so that as much as possible we're building all these components potentially away from Drupal to mimic a real page and make sure once it goes to Drupal all the components are going to play well together. And having a set of best practices in place so that as these are getting created there's some documentation or something to back it up on what the developers are working with. Uh, naming dimensions. From these screenshots you see that there's a very common theme of the atomic type and the dashed or camel cased variable names and to identify this component anywhere across the project including documentation. And you know, names with components gets to be very complicated as well. <laughs> you can spend a lot of time and a lot of stress over it. And in one respect, you know, you want to keep it very contextual so that as you bring it to a new project, the name makes sense. It wasn't something like, you know, the top nav doesn't help. But the other thing, you know, there's sometimes when your components are going to grow and change as you learn more and better ways to improve them that if the name isn't working, you might want to change it, you know, and to understand that it's okay, but you know, do what you can and just try not to stress too much. And when it comes to the file structure, um, because we are working with this concept that is focused around essentially a Drupal theme to manage the components, sort of the style guide, but then tie right back into Drupal, we want an easy way to have the component structure to match the template structure so that as we're working with Drupal templates, you find the component name and you go right to the component folder, you know one-to-one -one kind of what you're working with. There's less confusion. As well as the assets and other files uh, right off the theme. It's very clear and lightweight so that devs aren't hunting in subfolders and trying to guess, oh, well, where did that person put this? Right. Mm -hmm. And one thing in here, just in this here, uh, we worked with a team uh, and they never built Drupal before. So the idea was they approach us as building Drupal 
and they would build the front end. And uh, suddenly the deadline got really short and they had to start right away. So the approach we took was, okay, how about you guys build the front end and then we start working together and then building the back end and attaching together. Uh, because the company, the way they were doing the local setup and stuff, they couldn't get Drupal uh, installed right away. So what we did is we had our repo, we pushed to them, uh, they installed Pattern Lab, and then they started. So these guys never touched Drupal. So basically we had a daily stand up in the morning. We had our scope, what we were going to get done at that sprint, and then we would talk to their front end and they would say, okay, we are building this. How should I build? Because we had these standards, uh, they start following our standards. They start following our samples, uh, components that we have, it's like you guys are seeing before uh, in here. So they were working out of the components folder on top in there. And that is inside a Drupal theme. So these guys start building everything and we worked on a project for about a month or so, I think, and ended up being a very large project. And to this day, to this day, these guys don't have a Drupal installed on their site yet, on their site, on their computer. It was insane. Uh, it was the first time we done that, and it worked really, really well. So, what is that proving? It's proving that finding Drupal developers are getting harder but finding really good front-end developers is not that hard. And they are good on what they do. So why we have to force Drupal into these guys, into the daily? They don't care. It's front-end, right? So let's get them to build. It's a component. It's a photo that floats with a title and a description. Why you need to know that this is coming from a node and it has field underscore value blah 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 Drupal node PS thing? No, you don't need to, right? Just you don't need. All they need to know is what do you need to make. You know, when we go off the island using you know, not using Drupal, they don't make things complicated. If you go to one of those template sites that you buy and then you look the markup. Most, a lot of them are super clean markup, and the reason why is because they don't have this debt from technical debt from Drupal or from anything else, so they are building super clean. And that's the whole idea. So by structuring in a way that we can now extract that from Drupal, now we can have many teams working throughout that and not need to know. So. You know, maybe on a very large project, all you need is two Drupal guys and maybe five front end people doing that. Right? So, and that's what we are trying. Go ahead. Right. And when it comes back to keeping reusability in mind, you know, at first we were building things very isolated and thinking that, hey, you know, this is going to be great, I'm going to reuse it. And Again, as I mentioned, even down to some of the style variables, which I'm showing in the sample video here, we weren't thinking ahead. <laughs> you know, we were like, this is a great component. Okay, now how do I bring it to the next project? Even something as simple as making sure you establish how the styles are going to work, how some of the atoms are going to carry on, so that when you spin up the next project, you can depend on a certain amount of work carried over. That's where we had to get to, whereas before we were just copying the site and spinning it up, thinking everything was going to be great. As soon as you remove a couple things you don't want, and then it breaks. So building anything new now is keeping these things in mind and these standards to say, I know at some point this is probably going to be used, so how can I keep it simple, keep it focused to what that component style is. But in that small, you know, 1%, hopefully percentage, usually is more, unicorns exist. <laughs> and when it comes to componentization, you're going to kill yourself trying to satisfy components and unicorns, right? So sometimes you have a crazy design and you have something that is possibly used on one page in the site. Make it reusable and make it that perfect component because it might never have any value, right? And you drive yourself nuts for a couple days building it and it only gets used once. So there's potentially no reusability in a component 
and you have to be thinking and aware of this as you go. So back to the, the gnome and building components, question mark, profit, sanity. It really comes down to having some of these standards in place. And does that mean you have everything and all your standards ready to go when you start your next project? Probably not. You know, we've been working at it and we're slowly building up, building more, having more solidified standards that make sense. And we've definitely failed along the way. You know, pretty much every day we're working, we're doing something new wrong, we're realizing that why did we use this? And you know, making it too confusing even to explain in documentation. Well, that's a clear sign that we should clean something up, make it simple, make it clear for the developers to keep moving forward. So now I'm going to go into a bit of the specific component types and our take on how we had to start putting some of these standards in practice. Now, if you're not using atomic design or you have your own take on it, you know. Some of these will be a little more abstract for you, but you're going to start with something that's smaller, medium, big of some sort in your design library that you have to play with and you have to simply establish whatever that is, atomic design or not. So when it comes to atoms for us, we've come to the philosophy that they really should only do one thing well, which is very similar to Brad Frost's uh, methodology. And we define them a little more that the HTML might look a little more complex, but it's got a lot of fallbacks and things to make sure that all the different options and stuff make sure there's a very clean, simple DOM element at the end of it. It's never including, including another component. It's pretty rigid. You know, it has some options, but you can't override things. There's no blocks. It's just a truly simple component. When we start moving up to the molecule level, you know, this is a kind of a gray area because between a molecule and an organism, it gets wishy-washy sometimes. And we've had to, you know, establish the fact that you're only going to include a couple components, but here is now where you start to include some interactivity behavior in JS potentially. But the DOMs, you know, it's, it's not crazy. It's bigger than an atom for sure. And depending on the use case, it might be a little more rigid, it might be a little flexible, but it's still small and it's not going to contain anything too large that ends up on the page. Then when we move to organisms, this one was a big learning curve. It's back to the earlier video where I had the carousal and there's all these different types and there's all these different ways to use it. We were trying to send so much data to an organism that the organism would do everything. Oh, if we just give all the data, we can build all the molecules and all the atoms from the organism. And it became this monstrosity that was very hard to manage. And when it came to using some more layout style organisms, or the carousal again, the different slide types, you're stuck. You have all these variations, developers have to remember, well, which one, which twig do I call, and all these complicated things, whereas We've moved to a way that organisms are more layout focused and we prep and pass in actual ready to go components. And it's simply managing how they fit on the page and make sure it plays well with other components on the page level. So it simplified a lot of things for us. And because these are typically created for specific reasons, we have less fallback code here because they have a dedicated purpose. They're not going to be empty or blank, whereas the smaller components might have more optional features that I can show. So then moving beyond to more of the Drupal layer that we've been working on with our components is layouts. And this is where we have the node or uh, content type uh, level. And it's similar in a ways with an organism, but it has no behavior. Um, uh, organism would have potentially the most behavior because it's managing all of its parts, but the layout has almost no style, no behavior, and it has extendable parts of blocks, so that if you want to embed, you know, you have a page node type like this, and you're going to have another content type where all you're overriding is the content block, you're not going to recreate all this layout because it only serves the purpose to keep the header and footer, and it keeps things more simplified in this level for Drupal. And mockups. So when we started components, we would do a lot of organisms, molecules, and think, hey, it looks great. 
Let's put it in Drupal. I'll put it in Drupal. It looks like shit. Okay. <laughs> So we had to respect the fact that mockups are essential in building out these components together because as soon as you want the homepage and the set of components, again, you just work on the organism itself. Looks great, put it with other organisms. Oh, wait a minute. Now the padding, the margins, these things just don't fit well or get to responsiveness, similar kind of issues, right? So mockups became an essential part of our process and standards to make sure that we are working as we're building these all the way from the live page level because you just never know how it might get affected when you're focused too small. Actually, let me just... So, when it comes to the mock-up, uh, looking at the code in there, you guys may think, well, it takes a long time to build, but actually not really. And it saves us a lot of time because we can get things approved. If the site is really big, a lot of uh, UI guys look at the you. <laughs> Sometimes they don't create the design, and they say, the front end guys figure it out. <laughs> uh, if we tie that in Drupal, it will take a long time. If we are putting the mock-up, we can just push and say, hey, what do you think? Oh, it looks great. Go ahead, right? Uh, so back to this here, as you can see in there, page content, joy, include. So all this stuff in here from join below already has been written and the atom molecule in the organism level, right? All we are doing on the mock-up level is copying and pasting into the YAML file. So at this point, you can build a, let's say that you built the header, you have the call to action, you have your footer, and you have your slideshow, for example, your carousel. All you're doing to build a mock-up is you create your twig, and then you start including that stuff which you see in here. And that's it. So within less than 30 minutes, you're able to build a page. Uh, what we can do to, let's say we are having our stand up in the morning and then the client says, wouldn't it be awesome if we could switch this to this? And then our answer a lot of times is, sure. We can do that if you prioritize. We can do that uh, right after this call. Oh, really? You can do that? Yeah, we can, because now we're only dealing with static data into a YAML file, right? So that's why it's very important. And we found that out through this project working with this front-end team that wasn't doing Drupal. Uh, they were building all these components, looked really good. When we put on a page in Drupal, suddenly the paddings and everything was everywhere. So then we went back to them and said, hey, we will really have to build the mock-ups. Suddenly, when they start building the mock-ups, we start going like this. We were building a page within half a day and the pushing and the connecting to Drupal and the pushing to the content uh, specialists to start adding content and then figuring out little bugs and all that stuff. So it works really good and it's not as scary as it looks. And then the last aspect of uh, the component level kind of standards we've been focusing on is the Drupal side. So, as I was saying before, when we're doing organisms or even layouts, we were trying to shove everything into a big, huge data array, and it just didn't make sense. So, this is the concept here where we include, uh, at the top of this, for example, a text component. We prepare it, and then pass that along to the actual bigger component. So the big component deals with the layout, but we get to pick and choose, you know? Oh, there's no type? Oh, we're not gonna use that. We're gonna use a different subcomponent to feed into it. We're not stuck. We don't have to rewrite the organism now or the layout and say, oh, we didn't think ahead. We weren't thinking reusability, you know? We know that it's going to have something, but we wanna be able to switch it out where it makes sense. Okay, now to the big one. So how to package all this stuff and start reusing. So this, this has been quite a challenge. And we've been, you know, we had some fails and we had some wins. And uh, we're still working on it. Uh, we have quite a bit of uh, moving parts when it comes to this. So prepping and exporting existing code. So basically, you start working on a website, you 
or a sign to build a call to action or a summary of a news. Uh, you get to a point, you look at that, looks really good, and you don't have that in your library yet, which I will get into that at the end here. So the component level is the pattern level. It's the, the parts that the non-Drupal, the front-end people are building, which is markup and CSS. That's it. So when to export? What we've been finding is the best time to export is when it's at the white label stage, right? Because as you saw before, we are not, every variable that we use in, in CSS, it exists on the, on the main site, on the main uh, theme, so it doesn't break. So when we export that, we try to export always at the white label, white label level. So sometimes it doesn't work that way. We export at the end. So what we do is we go back a little bit and remove some of the specific branding from the client, right? Uh, one thing we learned, do not mix atoms, molecules, and organisms. When you're packaging that, if it's an organism, keep by itself, even if it's very little code. As soon as you start packaging a lot of stuff together, it doesn't mean that the next site will be using all that. And that is the thing. So small package, only what it is, and uh, how can we control all that? So basically, we use the markdown file with every single component, which is basically the readme file. So when we are building that, we just start writing, you know, the variables that we are using and they start writing the dependencies. So for example, you have a, a call to action that depends on the photo, uh, on the image atom. So you just, you know, write down on your markdown. And uh, the next team, when it's coming to reuse that, they will see and start understanding what it is. Okay, when it comes to the Drupal configuration, so probably a lot of you guys in here are doing Drupal 8, and uh, Drupal 8 has the amazing configuration. Actually, Drupal 8 is going to turn three years old. Can you guys imagine that? It's a freaking blow my mind that it's already three years. But uh, so we have the config files, which means that now we can export everything. Right? We can go manually in there and grab every single file and export. Uh, what we found is it's not the best solution, but the futures module works really good. And uh, for some components, for some, not some components, sorry, for paragraphs or for some entities, when you choose the bundle, you won't check every single box. So when you're building, it's good to kind of, as you're building, you start building your futures. And I don't know how many of you guys have worked with futures module before, but you can export on top of export. So just update, right? Uh, you create version 1.1, 1.2, or you keep beta when you're done, you export the whole thing. And uh, it's a module. When the Drupal exports uh, future, when the futures module exports the configuration, it's a full module, which means that now your backend guys can throw us some preprocess in there. You can put your template in there that will tie to your uh, component, your pattern. So one thing that we found, and uh, we exported a few components, and we imported into another site. What we discovered was some fields. So let's say that you add a image field, and then you call field underscore image. You bring it to your new site, your new site already has a field underscore image. It will have a conflict. So what we decide to do is to prefix every field with the component name. So you're having a call to action. So it's field underscore CTA underscore image. Field underscore CTA description. So that way, now that specific field belongs to that CTA only. So that's what we're doing. So it's a great way for you guys to not have conflicts later on. You can bring it to any site. Uh, when building, it 
kind of a hit or miss, but we find that building as we go is the best. But I'll be, you know, it, I can't all the time. It's just because sometimes we're really busy. So we try to export all the time, but we can't. So doing after, we always kind of have to remember all the fields that we did and everything. So if you do have the time, add that right away because we'll save you time later. Okay, so now that we have everything exported, which if you think about what means export, right? So futures will have a modules package and then your component, it's just a folder with uh, four or five files. That's it, right? So how can we now structure this in a way that we can go back or tell someone, hey, use this component here for this uh, slideshow you're building on this site. So basically, get to your friend. So what we decide to do is to put everything in the repo and then label, and again, it goes back to the vision and standards. So using standards for your naming. So in our case, the code name for our project, for our theme, it's called Ergo. Uh, so what we decide to do is our repo is called Ergo, the atomic name, the component name, and the type. And here's an example. So Ergo, O for organism, call to action, hyphen, FE for futures. So this is your uh, futures module. And even if you're not doing a full componentization and stuff, this is still really good. And we worked with a university. They are doing componentization, but in a little bit kind of a different way. And they are keeping everything in the futures module, which is very interesting. They are keeping their CSS, their markup, and everything in the futures module. And it's been working really, really good for them. So you guys can try that. And finally, ergo all call to action, CP, which is the component. So when we are doing that as well, what we do is, let me go back in here. We also, like Homer was saying, we start with one type of component, one pattern, one call to action that has an image, a title, description, and one button. Suddenly, we built one that the designer had a, a whole different idea. So what do we do is we build that one and then we just tag into a different version in our Git. So now we have two variations of that that we can go back and pull that into our new project. Okay. Okay, so how to import this thing? So when we first started, we started doing it manually and sometimes we still do. So basically, what does manually mean? So that I will go into my repo and I will download the, the files. And then I will go into my Drupal site, I will get the futures module, and then drop into the futures module folder in my custom Drupal folder. I will get my pattern, go into my theme, and then drop into, let me go back in here. Where is this structure home? Oh, almost there. And in here. And then drop into your components folder. Get your template. If it's not in your futures module, drop into the templates folder and then run gulp and this should work. So, and that's the manually way of doing this. So the other way that we've been exploring quite a bit and is still learning is using Composer. So we are already using Composer to manage Drupal. So we are installing Drupal, we are installing our uh, country modules, everything via Composer. We don't push modules to the server anymore. We let the server build the modules via Composer. So now your repo start getting really small because all the contrib stuff, it's not in the repo anymore. So we are doing that with our theme as well. So we are not keeping our CSS in the, in the repo anymore. We let the server build and then Homer does stuff, sends to, to the repo, I bring it down and that gets built on my computer at that time. Uh, Composer is awesome. Composer 
the last time we had that security issue with Drupal that we had to update the site right away uh, because it was just a few files, all we had to do is to update our composer file and only two files were changing. So then we pushed to the repo and then the server built and that was it. So very fast, so it's a really good way. So what we are doing is using Composer, adding these components that we have. So for example, you need a call to action component. So we add to our Composer file and then we'll pull the Drupal uh, futures module and your component and then put it into the right place because you can set on your uh, Composer file. So it works really good. If you guys go online and start searching for that, you will see the power of it. Okay. All right, uh, last aspect of this. Um, I'm not going into things like Gulp and uh, you know, Drupal Project Modules which help you get a step ahead with all of these tools, but something a little more basic that, you know, when you have all those in place and you go project to project, and then you think of local environments, you know, now there's Landfill, there's Drupal VM. So all these different ways of doing things that a local developer, we add all these component way of doing things and these new ways of building things, it just starts to become a headache, right? So we're working towards having a project level CLI and scaffolding tool that has a very straightforward set of commands that lets them do some Drupal stuff do some stuff with the SSH, whether it's Lando or Drupal VM, and then do some theme stuff, but keep it very simple and consistent, like documentation. So as they start to go project to project, they have a dependable tool, it's always there, and saves them time from having to, you know, create components especially, because as we're building these standards now, you know, for them to manually create these files and make sure it's using the right set up each time for each type of component, it gets very convoluted. So these tools just get them a step ahead without any extra effort. So we use it to help with Git management. You know, when you want to merge the dev branch to your local branch, deal with, you know, Git conflicts, we help streamline that. Um, when it comes to the tool, you know, you're typically running a certain subset of Gulp things, but what I want to go all the way into the theme folder, or remember which theme folder, you just do everything in the project root, nice and simple. And beyond running the Gulp commands, there's some helper theme commands that do things like rebuild node and other little gotchas that just save time and effort. And you know, the scaffolding as well, just to make sure that they run a couple commands, they get the new components in the right place with the right names ready to go. And even for some of the Drupal stuff, as I say, we're starting to transition to Lando, and it doesn't always work the Lando command the way you want, so we added some simple SSH commands to go straight in, do what we need, pretty hands off. And this is a sample again of the pre-generated code. So with my CLI, you just punch in the type of component you want. In this case, it's a molecule. I gave it a name, nav top. I typed it as a regular string with caps, whatever I wanted. Gives me the proper names, camel case, you know, dashed, all ready to go, all templated, and give me the best foot forward for the type of component. All right, so that's uh, up to the questions and answers now. I'm hoping somebody has some. In case you're wondering who made all those sexy screenshots, that was on me. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Any question on this crazy stuff? It's more a concept, so. Is everybody too scared? Yeah, there we go. Uh, I actually work with the uh, Drupal 7, but I'm wondering if it's possible to integrate it with Composer for usability of. In Drupal 7, you said? Uh, yeah, so the question was if we can use with Composer in Drupal 7 and using these components. I heard that there is some, uh, they are porting back Composer into Drupal 7, right? I think, I, I, I haven't done Drupal 7 in like two years or more, so I have no idea, but I heard that it is doing. Uh, you could, but I wouldn't really recommend 
I, to be honest, start doing componentization as soon Drupal 8 came out. And the reason why is because the templates now are clean and really well built using Twig. With the PHP templates that we had before, that thing is a nightmare. So as you saw in some of the slides, to pass data from a template to the component, we have to have a more clean way. And in Drupal 7, I don't think it would be that clean. But I heard that there are some people doing but I don't think we'll really take off because we are three years into Drupal 8. It's getting pretty solid in another maybe two years. I think we're Drupal 9 and Drupal 7 will be dropped. Thank you for the question. Anything else? Any other questions? Come on, don't be scared. Yes. Um, it's related to bundling. Uh, with the concept of componentization, um, previously, like years back, you would have all your HTML in one place, all your CSS in one place, sort of separated by type. Now we want to separate by component, have component have all the HTML, CSS, JavaScript. But for performance reasons, you still don't want to ship 100 different CSS files to the browser. That's right. Uh, yes. But ideally, if you have, let's say, if you have a more complex site, where some pages rely on different components that are not really used elsewhere, with a little bit more heavier CSS and JavaScript, you also don't want to compile everything into a single CSS file. Do you have any standards or tricks for figuring out? Oh, this should be a vendor like a common uh, uh, a common file. And this should be only this should be a separate file. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, some. Can you the... repeat the question? Sorry, uh, the question is around whether or not uh, you can separate some of the assets that come with all these components if you get a bunch together versus just giving everything at once. Um, so there's definite ways. I mean, inherently, the systems we're building uh, in Gulp will eat up everything, right? But there are ways to exclude and then use an attached library, right, to individually specify or without too much effort extend Gulp and say, I need a separate build process for a unique part of the site. Maybe it has a single page app that only works on mobile, and you don't want that heavy payload on every site, especially on desktop users. So there are ways to get around it. Uh, nothing too complex, but um, yeah, there, there are ways. But it comes to identifying you know, the right solution for the site, and you know, uh, not even just that, that you know, because Drupal behaviors and then you have all these components, sometimes auto running code, you want to make sure that things aren't running unless the component exists and, you know, you're saving cycles wherever you can. So there's a lot of performance considerations when the behaviors come in and to make sure that that's up to snuff and not just running wild. So. Yeah, in our case so far, we haven't seen, we haven't separated much yet just because what we try to do is if your code gets bigger than 100 or 200 lines, that means that your component's too big, right? Uh, keep it clean. So far, it's working pretty good, and we are not having uh, performance issues or anything. Uh, componentization, basically, when it gets through Drupal, it gets cached everything. Drupal 8 has an amazing caching system. So, so far, so good. We haven't had any problems. So thank you for the question. Anything else? Any questions? Go for it. Um, sometimes uh, you might run into issues when uh, some modules are being upgraded. For example, they, they may not work well with other modules. So if Composer does all the updating automatically, how can you avoid having those kind of problems? Like, <laughs> Yes, great question. So, oh yeah, the question. So I guess, so basically is how can we, if Composer updates module automatic, how can we then basically avoid conflicts and all this stuff? So we went, we went through that problem. So basically, initially when we were building our Composer file, we would let just basically every single version on that minor version would be coming down the pipe. And then we got into that problem. So we wanted to update Drupal core, but then we updated everything 
then Fields Group, Fields Group had a bug and it broke a bunch of stuff. So that was the time for us that we said, you know what, Composer, you're great, but we will have to tame you a little bit. So what we do now, we basically fix every single component to the version. And if it's a dev version, we lock to the commit. So the only one that we leave that's open is Drupal core. So that one will do, so you can update that one. So what does it do? What it does is makes you uh, mindful of what you're updating. So you get one person within the company and they will say, we have to update Drupal core and we have now three modules that we have to update. So that person will go to Drupal.org, check the version, check if there is any bugs, right? So if there is people are reporting bugs and stuff, if it feels good, you go back to your composer file and then you change from dot five to dot six, composer, install, and boom, you install. Then you can run that tasks and everything, if everything is good, then you push to the server and then we'll build that for you in there. That's how we're handling. Thank you. And we've also done this on the theme level. So we originally forked uh, Emulsify and worked with Aiden Foster on Mainspring, where it was kind of using the Powder Lab in a composerish way, but it was just freeform. So that from one project to the next, our developers could have ended up with different Powder Lab versions, and some of them had bugs, and there was inconsistencies. So we've been able to sort of corral that, and as part of the theme, have it as a composer dependency of a theme so that Patent Lab is working well, locked version, and we don't have to have any guesswork of, of, oops, the next project the theme doesn't build because Patent Lab has gone and done something that we couldn't test in that. So. Yeah. yeah, Composer is really powerful. I've been following the community and all that stuff, and uh, that's the way it's really moving, and that's the way it's going to be. Drupal Core is trying to ship now uh, Composer in Core, that you, you know that the Composer, that when we download Drupal Core, you can't update itself, right? Because that composer is in there, you have to remove. So your composer has to be out, your vendor's folder has to be out, and then your Drupal folder has to be in here. So the Drupal core composer only updates contrib modules, doesn't update itself. And then I just heard in the podcast that they are changing that, and they are working towards having that composer uh, update itself. I don't know how they're going to do that, but I heard they're doing it. So, cool. Any other question? I think we have five minutes or... Good. Okay, so... So yeah, so as I said, as I mentioned, we work for Therefore. We are a web agency here in Toronto. I am a technical architect in there and front-end developer. Homer is the same. Uh, if you guys wanted to work on some of this crazy stuff in here. Uh, we are always hiring. So when I first started, Alex approached me and said, hey, you know this crazy stuff you're doing? How about we do it together? And uh, he pays me to have fun. He's gone, right? Awesome. So, <laughs> so he pays me for you to have fun. So if you guys are interested in that uh, and like to join the company, submit, get in touch with us. If you don't want to join the company because we suck, but you like what we are doing, just join the Drupal TO meetup. We always open, like I said, I live and breathe this, and we always open to talk. Homer is the same thing. And uh, reminding everyone, so today we have the after party. If you guys want to go in there at our booth, uh, therefore, and the Pantheon, we are giving $20 uh, gift card for you guys to go there and spend. Uh, I went there yesterday for the first time. It's called the Rec Room. It's freaking awesome. They have a VR thing in there that you put the backpack and you kill ghosts and stuff. It's freaking awesome. And you can have beer while you're doing that. It's even awesomer. 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 <laughs> awesome. So just stop by our booth, our Pantheon, our partner, and I get a gift card, 20 bucks in there. And thank you very much.